We had a, God, it's hard to give everybody credit, you know, but I knew this fellow that was, uh, I would say he's insane. He's, or maybe you should say, maybe I would say he was, uh, he was ultra sane or hyper sane. Um, I can't describe it. His name was Dick DeMond. And uh, God, this guy could write me, he could write me 10 letters a day that were like manuscripts. And I, you know, he was like, I kept thinking, God, this guy is like an alien. I mean, what is going on? But anyway, he, he turns up about the time we're doing the Manuelito project. We're aware of the of the earthen of the of the manipulation of the uh, of the uh, of the environment for you know large scale architectural stuff, and uh, Dick is going on and on about power objects, and uh, I'm going yeah yeah. I couldn't follow Dick half the time. I didn't have the energy to, that was a problem. I mean, the guy, I just couldn't do it. But somehow or another, something seeped in. And that is when we were looking at, and this is, this is the moment when we realized that all the components of, of the Chaco eras uh, or ages were physically linked. And they were, and they were linked in uh, in communities that had looked like ironclad boundaries going back to basket maker. So we're talking about what we, what I would say is 90,000 square miles of territory with this place as its center and, and organized community, communities organized into provinces uh, around the rim of the basin and beyond. With, with no apparent uh, BS. I mean, you know, they, they, it all looks like you, they were under the thumb of, a, thumb of a tyrant from day one. There was no, uh, it's all the same. The architectural, the shards, the timing, everything correlates with what's going on in Chaco Canyon. So they got the memo. The memo went out, they got the memo. And they knew what to do. And so there, those changes were changes in vocabulary. But one of, the, one of the things that happened there is that the transition from, from the classic, what, 1075, into the post-Chaco, what we came to call post-Chaco, 11, uh, at Manuelito was uh, clearly defined by an umbilical that went from the Chaco period site into the post-Chaco site. And it, it was, there was no ambiguity about it. And that was a major, that was a major turning point. So we could say, wow, not only is this, not only can we say this is all Chaco and stuff from day one, but it's the, the changes in ceramics and architecture is all intentional and we're you know why i mean it could be calendrical uh and it could be partially you know uh, drought influenced but you know but people didn't just throw their arms up in the air and run into the you know and it was it was totally coordinated totally organized um and duman had set us given us the idea of power objects being taken out of the i mean if these if these are temples, which they are, they, they would house gods. And those gods were being, apparently, I think, being moved from one era to another on sacred space that was provided. You know, they, their feet never touched the, quote, ground into a, into a later building. Um, and that, so the Manuelito project was when we just, when we, when we came up with the uh, post Chaco and uh, the big house period. Now the big house period 
was really controversial because in the old Anasazi community days, we were unable to, uh, one of the reasons, purposes of that was to write National Register nominations. But we could not write a National Register nomination for a big house period site because it was not considered Chaco. So anything basket maker is not Chaco, anything P1 is not Chaco, anything after uh, 1100 is not Chaco, and especially not the quote uh, 13th century stuff.